What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Bootleg Football Podcast. We are in the thick of training camp for the 2020 season, uh, and football is fast approaching. It, it it feels like we're still in the in the dead of summer because we've had no preseason games, but regular season is kicking off in uh, probably about three weeks here. I think it is September 10th. So we are what 16 days away? Not even three weeks. So we are really coming up close to the start of the 2020 season. Dead in the middle of training camp. Uh, lots to talk about. Lots of injuries. Uh, a major free agent suddenly becoming available on the market due to uh, circumstances that we did not anticipate. Cough, cough, Earl Thomas. Uh, and we're going to update some uh, rookie DBs that are, are kind of flying under the radar that EJ and I kind of want to pat ourselves on the back for. So, huge, huge show. And with that, I want to welcome in my wonderful co-host, EJ Snyder. How you doing, buddy? And what are you drinking? I am happy to be here. It does feel like real football, which we weren't sure we were going to get. Uh, at this point, it's looking good. Uh, the COVID testing and the controls they've been doing, uh, not very many positives being returned. And among those that are, not very many players since the sort of opening round when everybody reported to camp. So that's great news going forward. And we're getting to see camp footage. So that's exciting. But lots to talk about, and I have a new beer, so it is from Everybody's Brewing, and I have had their beers before, Um, but this one looked like a lot of fun, and it is called Petrichor, and Petrichor is actually the name for the pleasant earthy scent after a heavy rainfall, so being from the Pacific Northwest, I am very familiar with that scent. It is a Hellas-style lager, alcohol's 5-2 by volume. It's only 20 IBUs, and if you haven't had a Hellas style lager, it's uh, uh, if you've ever had any Greek beer. Um, Greek beer? Yep. I uh, cannot say I have. <laughs> well, a clear, uh, clearish, um, not terribly heavy, easy drinking, so I like the style. I like the name. I've had stuff from Everybody's Brewing before, but I have not had this particular one, so I'm going to crack this puppy open and get ready. What are you drinking? So uh, I I did a little experiment this past week, specifically oh, for I this forgot. show. <laughs> so there's a technique, an old bartender's technique called fat washing, which sounds a lot more gross than it really is, and it's a way to infuse alcohol with different flavors, particularly from fatty things like say bacon fat. So if you want to infuse bacon flavor into your bourbon to make a bacon old fashioned. You use a technique called fat washing. Um, And so I did that. I bought some hatch green chili bacon from the grocery store, fried that up, had that for breakfast one morning, saved the bacon fat, and then I did an infusion of that bacon fat into some Buffalo Trace bourbon. And uh, I used that to make a hatch green chili bacon bourbon black walnut old-fashioned, I guess is the best way to describe it. So normal, I can't even keep up with that, man. It's a lot. It's a lot, but it's really damn good. Uh, I I've just been kind of experimenting, trying to you know come up with a new way to do an old fashioned. And so it's got the two ounces of bacon bourbon, uh, two dashes Angostura bitters, two dashes black walnut bitters, uh, and then my normal kind of uh, bar spoon of agave nectar to add a little bit of sweetness to it. So it's it's kind of a new a new take on an old fashioned. It's it's kind of like a Benton's old fashioned, which is like the mainstay bacon old fashioned, but a little bit different. Throwing in the black walnut and the agave, and it's uh, yeah, I got something here. It's pretty damn good, not gonna lie. So, if you ever want to try fat washing, there's a whole lot of videos on YouTube about how to do it. But it just kind of adds a little something extra to your bourbon, and uh, it's it's really damn good. But what do you say we get into uh, the extremely random i would say news of the week that nobody really expected coming and that was the earl thomas saga over <laughs> this in Baltimore. is the second week in a row that we've sort of said so uh what are we going to talk about on the show this week and and last week the night before we came together we put some ideas together and then everybody signed <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> george kittle signed travis kelsey signed um Everybody signed, and that became the show. And this week, we kind of did the same thing. We came together and said, what are we going to talk about? And 
<laughs> Earl Thomas went and got himself released, and uh, a couple other things came up. Some injury. We said maybe we could talk about some of those injuries, and then a couple more injuries dropped, and we thought well, we got to be really careful about what we talk about in our sort of little pre-show meetings because you know the universe is listening. But yeah, Earl Thomas, not expected news out of Baltimore, and I I don't know about you, but when I first heard the news. And I think you posted this on Twitter. You said, man, that fight must have been something if we're now talking about a release, right? A, a release. That wasn't Yeah, because training cards. camp fights are not that, like, it's it's not, it's a normal They're not thing. even uncommon. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the reasons here and what's come to light since uh, the fight with a lot of the folks that cover uh, the Ravens sort of adding in layers of detail. And most of it you may not have heard about. Um, I think it was Lindsey Ock that said, uh, you know, winning cures all ills. And there's not a truer statement in sports. And, you know, the Ravens did really, really well last year. So even if they had trouble beneath the surface, you weren't really going to hear about it. You were going to hear about the prevailing headline, which was Lamar leading to victory and, and the success they had. So uh, the reasons that started to leak out were... Uh, a lot of other things that indicated the fight was just kind of the last straw. So what have you heard about other stuff uh, besides the fight? So there's been a, a lot of dirty laundry that's been aired, part of it even by Earl himself, you know, in, in terms of uh, people from the organization saying he was late to meetings. There's rumor that he skipped a meeting one time to get his car washed, which is for a player of his veterancy seems inconceivable that you would skip a meeting to get your car washed. But apparently that's a thing that happened. There was a confrontation with Brandon Williams uh, after practice one day. And first of all, Earl, read the room. How that crazy dude's... do you have to be? Oh my God. He's got a hundred pounds on you. What are you doing, bud? Like Brandon Williams, for those of you that don't know, is one of the most massive humans you know, on the planet, but definitely yeah. in the NFL. And that's a thing, right? There are a lot of massive humans in the NFL, and Brandon Williams stands out. He looks like he's hewn out of a block of stone. Um, so anybody that would go after that guy, especially um, somebody like a safety or a wide receiver or a small running back, has either got to be nuts uh, well, I guess has just has got to be nuts. I can't think of, <laughs> I can't think of anything you could give me that you said, hey, if you if you take a swing at Brandon Williams, I'd be like, nope, I'm out. I, you you said take a swing at Brandon Williams, like no, that's just that's inconceivable. He's not to mention crazy. like Brandon Williams is loved in that building. Like he's yeah. he's one of the leaders of the entire organization. He's on the players council. Like he has John Harbaugh's ear. Uh, getting into it with him, and I'll say this: the Ravens are a very unique culture. Um, they're like a family atmosphere there where if you're drafted into the Ravens, like it's almost like you're a Raven for life. Like you are a Raven. Uh, and Earl is, he was a bit of an outsider, not going to lie. Like he's coming in, he's a big name free agent, which they don't do a whole lot in Baltimore. They don't typically spend a whole lot of big name free agents. The last one I can remember was probably Steve Smith. Um, and, but Steve kind of ingratiated himself within that culture and like you, if you're going to be on that team, like you have to be all in for the Ravens. There is no me there. It is all we. And so I, I think crossing Williams, who is one of the most we guys in that whole building, like everybody on that team would back up Brandon Williams over Earl Thomas. He, for lack of a better word, was not one of them. And I think Earl did a bad job of reading the room <laughs> and realizing, like, look, I don't care that you're a Super Bowl champion, all pro, probably going to be in the Hall of Fame. Like, that's our dude. Like, they're, they're going to back one of their family, like Chuck Clark, before they ever back Earl Thomas. That's just how that team is run. So I think it was a grave miscalculation on Earl Thomas's part. Uh, not to mention, because Chuck Clark is a good player, but he's he's one of them. Like, you don't mess with one of the family. Uh, and so he got released for it. And again, Baltimore, like they're a team, like they know they're good. They know they don't necessarily need him. They're big fans of Deshaun Elliott in that building taking over at free safety. They didn't feel like losing Earl was going to cost them that much on the field. And they're always going to protect the family before anything. So they're, they're happy to eat that money and let him 
you know, maybe go cause problems somewhere else. And and Ravens are a unique team in that way. There's a lot of other teams that I think would have put up with it. Baltimore's not one of them. So when we talk about where he's going to go next, I think there is a risk factor. And we're not even going to talk about the family thing that happened this offseason because that's just that's its own thing, <laughs> to be perfectly that's honest. That's what we'll just classify as an off-the-field risk. We'll just it's say its that it's own not, thing. <laughs> that, not the kind of thing that an NFL team wants its players involved in. Um, at the same time, like you said, some organizations would care more about that. Some would only care and give it lip service. Some wouldn't care at all and, and probably not even comment on it and just say, hey, whatever's personal is personal. Um but it certainly wasn't something that reflected in a good light uh, on Earl and um, hence on his employer. So it is a risk that has to be considered. We're not going to dive into it. But he's now been run out of town by two first-class organizations that both have strong cultures. He clashed with Pete Carroll, said, hey, you know, I think I'm bigger than the team. Pete and John Schneider said, no, nah, you're not. And they let him walk. That wasn't a terribly popular move in Seattle, but uh, because Earl had been such a large part of that organization's uh, very uh, high-profile success for a long time, Ravens picked him up. But you said, again, the Ravens are another strong culture team that very strongly believes in that concept, team first, right? It's not just a lip service thing. And both of those organizations have now let him go pretty much within the last year. That's... Um, going to be an indicator to other teams that are on the same way that they better do their due diligence and find out what they're really getting. Again, other teams in the NFL, all about talent first. They're not going to care so much. But um, for some teams, that's going to be a factor. And then there's the how good is Earl Thomas question, right? He's still a good player, right? We're, we're not debating that at all. But he's not prime Earl. And prime mm-hmm. Earl was the center fielder The coverage guy in all the NFL. Nobody had range like Earl Thomas. He could erase more of the back third of the defensive football field than anybody else in the game in his prime. He's not quite there, but he is a savvy veteran. Uh, He's going to pick up systems very quickly. He can still run. Uh, His technique's pretty good. Leverage is good. Certainly has a great understanding of concepts. There's not too many times you're going to see Earl Thomas get fooled. So mentally, he's there. Um but he's not that prime prime, right? He's not 10 out of 10. He's probably eight and a half or I don't know, maybe nine out of 10, depending on the day. Um, not a great tackler. We'll say that there's some times last year that he sort of made business decisions. <laughs> there's that clip of Derrick Henry pushing him around when he tried to tackle Derrick Henry high, which never seems like a good idea, but what else are you going to do? So there's a couple of risks, but one is really, does he fit with your culture? That's probably the biggest one. And then it's, um, you know, there's even if Earl Thomas has declined, there's not too many teams in the NFL that are going to say, well, our guy is clearly better than Earl Thomas. <laughs> yes, he's still a top 10. Well, maybe not top 10 safety overall, but top 10 free safety. Yes, you know, top 10 free safety. I would get on board with pretty easily in terms of fits. I would say I mean, there's a lot of teams that he quote unquote fits in. So Cleveland, I think, is. To me, one of the most obvious, especially after seeing Grant Delpit go down with an Achilles today, or at least reportedly an Achilles, um, yeah. they have the most money in the NFL. They got forty million in cap space, which is just a hell of a lot of money going into August. You know, so I would say if you want to get them for a two-year front-loaded deal with that forty million, which to be honest, you're gonna you're never gonna get them at a deeper discount than you are right now. You could get him for <laughs> it's the in back his shelf is wide open. Go exactly. Ahead. You got plenty yeah. of money. Uh, it's a division rival, so I think if he's if he's angry, um, I, I think maybe going to a division rival where he might get to take out some of that anger on Baltimore twice would be good for him, or rather, beneficiary to the team. Like there's a wide open hole at free safety now that Delpit's hurt. There might even be a hole next year because, again, Achilles can't guarantee he's going to be back in 12 months. So if you can get a two-year deal front load with all that cap space uh, and give Delpit as much time as as he needs, really, 
to to hopefully at least get close to 100%. You're not trying to rush him back for September next year. Uh, I think that that makes sense for the team. It makes sense for Earl because maybe he can get if if there is so such a thing as revenge in this scenario, which I, I think it's a justifiable release. But if Earl uh, wants to get quote unquote revenge on Baltimore, Cleveland's probably the best place to do it. Uh, so it makes sense for him. Uh, the, the only question I have is, would he fit within that locker room? Would Kevin Stefanski, as a first-year head coach, want to deal with that? I I don't know, but I think um, if there was ever a time that maybe Earl would want to rein himself in a little bit and prove that that he can still fit in a locker room, you know, maybe he will kind of calm down after being released by two Grade A organizations within a year of each other. Like maybe he will, but. I I, I, don't, I can't guarantee that, but I will say if it doesn't work out, they've got a whole a whole lot of money, and it's not like they're really losing that much. Yeah, Andrew Barry, as the you know relatively new GM of the Browns, is is going to have to take a hard look at it and decide whether or not um, it's team first, family first, as you said, uh, or if hey, our you know top flight rookie that we had penciled in as basically a starter from the draft who is definitely not going to be there, as you said, for this season and maybe not for next season either. Do we sort of look this gift horse in the mouth and maybe sweep some of those things, missed meetings or whatever else under the rug and say, go do your thing. Uh, The other thing is, you know, Grant Delpit's going to be getting mental reps this year. Once he heals up, he's going to be back with the team and who better to sit under than Earl Thomas and say, Hey, why'd you do that? You know, tell me what you saw there. So that's that's a possibility too, but uh, the combination of Barry and Stefanski are going to have to get together and say, is this a risk we want to take, or are we are we good to go? Are we loaded up? Are we going to run with what we have? Next one's Dallas. That's the obvious one that everybody's talking about. Um, mm-hmm. Some people even suggesting that Earl shot his way out of Baltimore so he could get to Dallas. I don't know that there's a lot of weight or veracity. I, that I don't here. buy him intentionally getting himself released. Uh, I, I I think that was uh, Earl severely miscalculating the situation yeah. and, and maybe getting served a piece of, of much needed humble pie. But I don't think he was angling intentionally to get out of Baltimore like maybe AB was intentionally angling to get out of Oakland. Yeah, it didn't feel the same way to me that that did, or, or we've seen that certainly in player situations multiple times over the past two or three years where, where players are, I mean, we saw it this offseason with um, Yannick Ngakwe, right? Mm-hmm. Jacksonville, like openly clashing with the owner, forget the coach or the GM, he just went straight to the top and like had it had it out with the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, so we've seen plenty of players try and quote unquote shoot their way out of town and this didn't feel like that. So I, I don't put a ton of stock in the, the sort of conspiracy theory that he was headed to Dallas, but Dallas is an obvious hole. They've got 14.8 million in cap space. I don't think anybody clearly on the roster that is again, better than Earl Thomas and he, he could fit in very quickly there in terms of the system so a lot of people are going to talk about dallas that also almost makes it less interesting to me because so many people are saying that as an option Mm -hmm. um how do you see the dallas thing so i feel like they kind of already have a free safety and a haha clinton dicks not saying haha is as good as earl but i i don't think they're desperate because I think Haha is a lot. I mean, you're a Bears fan. You know that's better than anybody. Else. I was going to say you're talking about Chicago Bear great Haha Clinton Dix, <laughs> great in air quotes. He said, uh, but you know he's a lot better deep, and so I kind of feel like I, I don't want it to be another Eddie Jackson situation where it's like we have to put Haha deep because he can't play anywhere else, which then makes you put Earl somewhere else instead of being deep. You know, it which happened to Eddie last year. It's like Eddie had to play down low a lot more because he was the only one of their guys who could do it rather than playing his best spot, which is free safety, where he was arguably a defensive player of the year contender the year before when he was playing, you know, deep more often in that uh, Vic Fangio quarters coverage scheme. So I, I don't necessarily think it's like, I, I mean, it's a fit obviously, but yeah, it didn't feel great to me. Like it's, it's okay. It's just okay. You know, it's not as easy a fit 
it's not as easy to translate the as Cleveland, you know, where it's like, hey, we need right. a center fielding free safety day one right now. Like that's that's and we have money and you can get revenge and we have <laughs> money and you can get revenge. Whereas Dallas, it's like like we got to pay Dak like we got to roll that money over like we can't just like they were planning on rolling that that money over. Yeah, it's already earmarked. And again, it's not something that's the piece, the difference, right? Yeah. They're not one player away in the secondary from going to the Super Bowl. They have they have other needs, right? So it doesn't feel as easy as as a lot of people on social media certainly have tried to make it like, oh, the you know, obvious choices. He's going to Dallas. He's going to be a cowboy. And I was like, obvious? Uh, not like not it, maybe, maybe it's as obvious Earl, when you dig in. Maybe yeah. it's what Earl wants, but yes. it doesn't mean it's what's best, you know? No. At least for the team. Like, if I'm Dallas, I'm just being like, look, we're fine. We're fine, you know? Yeah, I don't think I'd spend that money on Earl uh, again because not only do they have to pay Dak, but they've got other they've got other bills coming due. And um, I don't think the balance of what Earl gets them for what is going to be a season or two is worth it, right? I would yeah. rather have that money and use it in other in other areas so the next one comes up um interesting source k adams good morning football suggested the chargers and at first i thought huh and then her rationale was hey you get to play with derwin james which sure that seems absolutely great and the defensive connection he already knows the system he gets reunited with gus bradley and that made me think okay especially in a sort of odd off season which would be much shorter because he's not going to have a ton of time to get up to speed with whatever team he joins because as you mentioned we are 15 16 days away from playing you know football with with real bullets here games that count um but his familiarity with gus bradley and the system would be a very good selling point so not a spot i'd considered but an interesting landing spot and I'll say this as somebody who's a big fan of Nasir Adderley when he was coming out of college. Like, Nasir yep. Adderley is as explosive as Earl was in his prime. Uh, there is a reason why they took him in the second round. Like, he he is an explosive, explosive guy. Now, he dealt with a lot of injuries last year. He came back this year healthy. Supposedly, he's looked pretty good in camp. You know, Bradley said he's a lot more focused this year, and it sounds like they really like where Nasir Adderley is heading. But again, is is Nasir Adderley right now as good as Earl Thomas? I don't know if I would say that. You know, not saying he I can't wouldn't. be. <laughs> I'm not betting on that just because of experience and looks seen. Right? Exactly. It's the experience thing. Like Nasir at right now probably is more explosive than Earl is uh, yes. in, in terms of athleticism. But experience and especially within that system and just general football IQ, like that matters a lot. And I think that would give Earl an edge. And it's I'm not saying that Nasir will not eventually be the starter there, but if you're the Chargers, you got 13.7 mil. You can throw uh, an incentive-laden deal at, at Earl to be like, just come on down for a year. We're trying to make a run at this thing. Um, you know, Adderley can learn under Earl. And then, again, you only have to do a one-year deal. Like, you're not locking him up for four or five years like Baltimore tried to last year. It, just because the system fit, he already knows everything about it. Like, it does make sense. It absolutely does make sense. Um Again, they're not desperate for it because I do think Nasir Adderley is going to eventually be a really good player. But as of right now, if you're trying to take on the Chiefs, if you're trying to take on the Broncos, the Raiders are looking pretty good, in my opinion, too. Like, you kind of need Earl Thomas if you want to compete in this division. We we talked about that, that he's going to have no shortage of targets to try and shut down that yes. division. We talked about it in our divisional draft recap. Uh, we've talked about it a couple of times since then. We brought up a thing about... Uh, AFC West receivers in a podcast a couple of episodes ago, there is no shortage of guys running routes uh, well in that division and having a weapon like Earl Thomas, a defensive weapon to try and shut one or multiples of them down would be very valuable to the Chargers defense. And it allows Derwin James, who can do it all, can play deep, he can play near the line, but he's extremely physical, really fast the kind of guy you don't mind putting close to the ball in fact it just gives him more opportunities 
it lets Derwin James do other things, knowing that Earl is again patrolling the backfield and, and taking away those deeper options. So, um, props to Kay for for bringing that one up um, and having a justification for it. Uh, an interesting spot. Um, the next one's all you. I hadn't heard it. Uh, you have, so I'm gonna let you take that one. So Deshaun Watson has been kind of subtly hinting that he wants Earl Thomas to be in Houston. Uh, he's he's made it known that he looks up to Earl. They're good friends. Uh, he says, you know, he's excited to see where he ends up, uh, which to me is a <laughs> is a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. You know? And and Absolutely. Houston has a lot of money. They they got more money than most teams on this list. They got twenty one million in space. Um, and now in terms of fit, like Reed, I think is already a good free safety for them. Uh, he can play strong. I, if if you're bringing in Earl, I would probably shift Reed over, um, and then have Earl play free and Reed play strong, which I think would be a very, very, very good safety duo. Uh, but again, like Bill O'Brien is a very headstrong coach, and I'm not you sure. Don't say. <laughs> I just I don't think he'd put up with Earl's shit. You know, and I, I, I don't trust at this point in time Earl to not be Earl, you know, <laughs> like, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I like, had this discussion this week. It's funny that you bring it up. So uh, my other podcast co-host, Jeff Burks, and I had a discussion about a Bill O'Brien on a separate topic, not not this one. And what it came down to was Bill O'Brien's got a massive ego and Bill O'Brien, the coach, or Bill O'Brien, the GM, is Bill O'Brien's the coach's worst enemy. Yeah. Right? He does things as a GM because he thinks he can coach them all up. Right? He, he's like, nah, I can I can continue to make chicken salad out of chicken feathers. Right? And he puts himself in these really uh, untenable situations, but it's, it's ego-driven. Um, Bill O'Brien is certainly not short on believing that his way is going to work. And if it comes down to his way or Earl's way, there's there's no question as to what that's really going to end up as, right? It's going to be Bill's way. He's he's shown that throughout this offseason and really throughout his tenure there. So uh, from a culture fit, I'm going to give this one like a two out of ten. Like it's it's yeah. not – it doesn't it's, look good on paper. It's one of the worst culture fits, I would say, that you can have. But – I had to bring it up just because Deshaun seems to be kind of internally campaigning for it, which I find interesting. Well, you know, if you're Deshaun Watson, it makes sense, right? Let's make the defense better so I don't have to score as many points. I I, I can't fault Deshaun for saying, hey, I'd love to have a world-class free safety, you know, trying to keep the other team's score lower. Go for it, right? Yeah. I, I, think, I think the fifth team on the list is a much better fit than Houston. Though. This one makes a ton of sense. This one you brought up, and at first I thought, okay, from a talent standpoint, like there's nobody standing in his way. Um, from a money standpoint, I needed to look it up. And again, more money than almost everybody except for the Browns on this list, but plenty of cash. Um, and, you know, again, we're talking about culture fit. You're going to need a strong coaching staff that understands their way and their system, but is also... Uh, I don't want to say tolerant uh, of veterans, but knowledgeable of veteran football players have been around the block, understand that there are things you can put up with and things you can't. And there are things you can, you know, die on a hill for. And there are things that you shouldn't. And Washington has all those things. They have a need. They have the money. They have a very strong coaching staff. So the Washington football club is sorry are they calling themselves the washington football team yes i, I can't officially okay speaking. i the nomenclature escapes me but the washington football team which again is better than its former nomenclature uh but just a little bit vague makes more sense you sold me on this one you brought it up and we talked through the options and the more we talked about it the more i thought you know yeah, he could come in. They definitely have a need. And the thing that I thought of as we were having the conversation is playing behind that defensive line, mm-hmm. he's going to get some opportunities. Those guys are going to be able to rush the passer. They are going to cause some short, quick duck throws. And Earl Thomas, of all people, 
is going to be in the best possible place to capitalize on that. And then you brought up a great geographic reason, right? He doesn't have to move. Yeah, they're right there. I mean, Baltimore and uh, where's the uh, where's the uh, Washington practice facility at again? I know Arlington? it's not. It's not in Landover. No, uh, I wanted to say Arlington Heights, but that's not right. Um, but I mean, DC and Maryland, I mean, they're right next to each other. Like, it's yeah, not... I actually used to live right in between them. I used, I lived in Crofton, Maryland, which is pretty much equidistant between Washington DC and and Baltimore. It was about you know thirty five minutes each way to get to either one. So yeah, if you're in one and you're getting to the other, it's certainly closer than any other NFL team. And they just have everything else that he would need. They have enough money, 31 million. They certainly don't have anybody at free safety. That's going to stand up to Earl Thomas's quality. He doesn't need to move as a player. And with Ron Rivera there um, in some capacity and a very veteran coaching staff, we talked about this a couple pods ago. Um, They've got everything that would, it seems like a very good landing spot for Earl. Yeah, and I I think Ron, he's dealt with so many strong player personalities himself. Like, he, Earl is not really going to be, like, a new thing. Like, Josh Norman, again, is not the same kind of guy as Earl, but strong personality. Cam Newton, strong personality. Steve Smith, extremely strong personality. Like, and those, none of those guys are bad guys. I'm just saying like, they're, 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 they, they take all the air out of the room when they step into it. You know, they, they own whatever space they are in, especially Cam. Like he is, he's Superman, you know? And so Ron Rivera has a lot of experience with these just gigantic personalities that that own attention everywhere they go and i think he knows how to handle these these monolithic personalities and i think if the, he's one of the few coaches that i think could actually sit down with earl man to man and basically say like hey i need you to stop messing around like i need i need <laughs> you to show up to meetings all have, right fly have, right earl let's you know, go and, and I think Earl would listen to him because everybody loves Ron Rivera. Like, he's one of the most highly highly respected people in this whole league. Um, Honestly, if anybody could, Ron's in that category. And you're Ron right. Ron is in that category. a handful of guys that could sit down and say, look, I, you know, I'm not going to judge you on your past stop, but this is what I'm going to need you to do if you're going to be here and play with us. And, and Earl would listen. I truly believe Earl would listen. Like, I, I, I Bill O'Brien is way too emotional for Earl. Ron Rivera is very <laughs> even keel. I think he could actually get through to him. Bill and him would just start throwing fisticuffs, like, day one. You know, like, yeah. there's the, you need the right kind of coach for him. Uh, and, and I think Ron is that kind of guy. So if it was me, the top two teams all day, Cleveland and Washington – Knowing me, I, he's not going to end up on either of those teams, and he's going to go to Dallas, and we're going to have another podcast talking about this, saying why the hell is this happening. But if it was me, or it's... you know, Deshaun's going to get his way, he's going to oh, end up God, on the no. team that you follow, and we're just going to well, I'm just going to sit back with popcorn and watch the fireworks between him and Bob. But uh, God, yeah, please no. Anyways, moving anyway. on to yeah, moving on to uh, what I would call a more palatable discussion uh, of some kind of fun stuff. We wanted to talk about uh, a section that you're calling under the radar rookie cornerbacks, and these are folks that we talked about um, in our pre-draft work and our post-draft work, our, our draft recap series. But these are folks that we talked about before they got drafted that we were um, excited about. So we've got three of those for you. Um, the first one up is Damon Arnett ended up getting drafted by the Raiders. Arnett is a guy that I was extremely high on coming out of Ohio State. Um, higher, I think, than, I don't know, what, what would you think is fair about my character, the characterization of uh, my rating for Damon Arnett pre-draft? You were higher than most. I think you and I both landed on him as a first-round talent and probably, I, I think I had him like third or fourth in corners it was him and gladney were kind of back and forth i think for uh for cb3 for me i think you had him top three as well if i remember 
Yeah, I had him above Gladney. I liked him better, and a lot of people thought I was nuts for that. But um, the thing that I loved about Damon Arnett especially was his outside technique. So Damon Arnett was a guy that was thinking about coming out the year prior, um, realized that he had some things to work on, stayed in school, worked on it, and, and in this case profited greatly from it. He improved in his final year at OSU exactly the way that you want to see a player improve. His technique on the outside, on the boundary, is as good as anybody in this class, Mm -hmm. with the exception of his teammate. (laughs) Yes. Jeff Akuda is is like a robot. Jeff Akuda, who's been having, you know, very good um, early returns from his practices as well. But everybody expected that. A lot of people, I don't want to say slept on Arnett, but definitely had Arnett farther down the board. When I watched Damon Arnett, he had a skill set made for the modern NFL, which is the ability to be that one-on-one jet fighter, eliminate another team's top threat down the boundary, and eliminate big gains, right? And his interior technique, his technique against the slant, cuts, curls, all the short stuff, wasn't tremendous, but it was what I would call very coachable, very coachable or easily adjusted. And he had shown the ability to adjust even in game to limit those throws as well. His outside technique is picture perfect. It's it's beautiful. Like it's what you would put in a textbook. Also remember what kind of system does Paul Gunther run? If the corners are going up against a receiver most of the time they call it a match three coverage or they'll run cover one but most of the time if they're in zone it's match three i just did an episode on this in the film room like paul gunther's their defensive coordinator he learned under mike zimmer mike zimmer does the exact same thing anytime a receiver breaks underneath within the first five yards guess what the corner's gonna let him go that's the linebacker's responsibility so arnett doesn't even have to worry about that a lot like if they're if they're in man, he's always gonna have inside help, so he can use and just bully people into that boundary all day, knowing that he's got inside help virtually on every play, unless they're in zero, I guess. But they they rarely are gonna be in zero. Like this is a perfect system fit, and he's gonna beat the crap out of people. I know this is me pounding the table for exactly what you said, which is we talk about this all the time: is the landing spot determines the success of the player, right? The The player has talent. The player has ability. The player has knowledge of a system fit, right? And if all those things line up and they're very close uh, to what they had in college or, you know, they can adapt a little bit, they're going to have more success early. And this is this is exactly that. This is that in a nutshell. That's the same system largely that he played at OSU. Not the same system defensively exactly, but in terms of his responsibilities, he would let those inside routes go because, again, he knew they they weren't his primary responsibility. So he was already good at it. Uh, But what came out this week was a video of him going against uh, Ruggs, their first-round receiver pick. And, again, pristine technique. He matches Ruggs step for step there was some concern about his speed which was odd he ran a four five something uh at the combine but if you watched him on film there wasn't a tremendous concern about speed he didn't get run by hardly ever anyways this clipper rugs from raiders camp he is uh, he is glued to his hip he is hip to hip with rugs throughout the entire route rug gives a little stutter early and then goes and arnett is right with him ends up grabbing the interception in a basket catch doesn't even reach up and grab it with his hands doesn't have to has great inside position and leverage just reaches out with his arms and comes away with a pick because he is mirroring shadowing whatever you want to say he is he is right in rug's hip pocket ends up getting the pick um and it's just again it's a perfect case for staying in school for all the time somebody stays in school and and kind of has a crappy season or gets hurt or the coaching staff changes and and they get thrown into a bad situation just the opposite of what i just said um arnett is the is the flip side of that coin where stayed in school stayed in the system polished up his game and and looks like he's just off to a flying start yeah, he's he's been tremendous. I think he's proving that Mike Mayock knows what the hell he's doing. Uh, and, and he's a first-round pick well spent, I think, in our opinion. Uh, in the other side of the spectrum, one of our undrafted gems, who I think we're going to be bringing up a lot over the next few years, 
Uh, we loved him before the draft. We loved him after the draft. And so far, he's doing really well in training camp down in Tampa Bay. And that's undrafted corner Parnell Motley out of OU, who, I mean, he had two picks today alone. One off Brady, one off Gabbert. Uh, he's at a very, very strong camp. I think it's become clear that that he's probably going to end up making this team, like we predicted way back when in our 10 Gems episode. Uh, and and he's, he's proving that, above all, tape really does not lie. And when you're in the Big 12, if you're one of the few corners in the Big 12 that can stop all of these crazy, talented Big 12 receivers, guess what? You, you deserve to be on a roster in the NFL. And uh, just a tremendous job by Tampa to believe that tape uh, and not pay attention to the time speed and all that kind of stuff and, and, and look at the tape and be like, huh, this guy's actually giving Denzel Mims problems and he's the only corner that's doing it. We should probably get this guy in. Uh, and, and just all the credit in the world to Tampa for, for believing in him and, and putting him uh, on their roster for training camp because I think they're going to get a starting corner out of it. Yeah, it's a tremendous value. A guy like Motley who – Cornerbacks are premium position, especially in the modern NFL. Multiple receiver sets is the norm. Um, nickel and dime are the new base. The played far more than any actual quote unquote base defense. You need defensive backs that can cover all across the board. Safeties, slot corners, boundary corners. To get a talented corner who had success against top receivers, guys that were taken in the first and second round, as an undrafted free agent is a massive value. And that is going to hang with Parnell Motley and the Bucks for, you know, probably two or three years. They're going to get a guy who has what looks to be starting caliber chops for chop liver for nothing Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, they didn't spend a draft pick on him and they don't have to pay him anything. Now by anything it's league minimum. That's up to, you know, half a million a year or something like that. And Parnell Motley, if if I could get odds out of a Vegas casino, the NFL has a program where they have a pay differential based on how many snaps you played versus your draft position. And if you outplay your draft position, position like by a ton, you get a bonus. <laughs> and for some <laughs> of these guys, it's up to – more than half of their salary and motley is going to be the leader in the clubhouse right he's going to outplay his undrafted free agent status uh if everything holds the way it looks so far and uh eddie jackson was one of these guys right drafted in the middle rounds ended up starting ended up playing at a very high level his rookie year he ended up with like a 200 something thousand dollar bonus which was like half of his salary um you know, so it could be a huge bonus, and and Motley looks like a guy that's absolutely in line to earn one of those bonuses this year. Yeah, I mean, how many undrafted corners are picking off Tom Brady multiple times and getting PBUs against Mike Evans and red zone drills? Like, this is not a camp body. Like, this dude's real. No, yeah, the defensive <laughs> coaches have said that he's had his hands on the ball every day in practice. Right, it's not an isolated thing. Um, he's breaking balls up. He's picking them off. Um, he just, all the arrows are pointing up, uh, you know, he was initially a guy that you were very high on after I took a look at him on your recommendation. I was like, Nope, you're not wrong. Um, so we ended up both being very high on him before the draft and he is proving us right. And we love that. That's, that's amazing. It's great for him. It's great for Tampa. And the last guy is Cameron Dantzler, who we had a difference of opinion on. People say that we always have the same opinions about players and that we're always... We actually took a little crap in the last podcast for our something like relentless positivity. <laughs> the commenter <laughs> said something like, you know, this this sort of relentless positivity is starting to wear thin. And I was like, well, I guess if I'm going to be accused of something, that's not a bad one. But Cameron Dantzler is one of the cases where I looked at him and his numbers aren't tremendous in terms of his measurables, right? If you're if you're purely one of those people that believe in sort of relative athletic score or or other things, and you weight that more than tape, sort of the pure physical tangibles, Cameron Dantzler was not necessarily your guy. He was not going to be high on your list. Uh, I tend to swing the other way. I I look at those things and I consider them, and I consider them quite frankly a really valuable part of the process. 
but tape is always going to be first to me. What did what did this guy do against other, you know, did he do his job? It, did he do his job that he's going to be hired to do against other guys that are committed to <laughs> making sure he doesn't do his job? And Cameron Dantzler is one of those guys. He played Alabama and LSU last season. And in both games, in those two games against two of the highest powered offenses in college football, he allowed a total of 21 yards combined. Oof. That's Jamar Chase. That's Jefferson. That's Clyde Edwards-Alaire. That's all those guys. So uh, the tweet that brings this up comes from Sam Monson, uh, Pro Football Focus. Adam Thielen apparently came up to Mike Zimmer today at practice and told him 27 is going to be really good. 27's Cameron Dantzler. Dantzler, and then he goes on to quote that stat about Alabama and LSU. I loved Cameron Dantzler after I watched his tape. Before that, I was kind of, eh. When I watched his tape, I was like, I don't care what the numbers say. Look at what he does against top quality receivers. Now, the entire we've talked about this before. The entire Auburn secondary got drafted. Both safeties, the nickel, and both outside corners ended up in the league. So very talented secondary, but they played very talented offenses. He was always up against wide receivers in the SEC, usually took on the primary receiver. He had a tough assignment every week, and he crushed most of them. When you see a guy do that, you kind of throw all those testing numbers out the window. He looked a little bit slow, looked a little bit stiff in some of his just athletic drills on the field by himself, but you put a helmet on him, you put a guy and a helmet across from him, And you look at the results, and it looks like that's carrying over. Now, Mike Zimmer, we talked about this before the show, notoriously hard on rookies, never has anything good to say about rookies, said something fairly neutral about Dantzler, which in Mike Zimmerdom is a a positive, (laughs) right? It's a massive compliment if he doesn't say he sucks. Um, But, you know, Adam Thielen, very good wide receiver, Uh, I would just say in the league, certainly in the NFC North, being a Bears fan, really familiar with Mr. Thielen's work, for him to come up and say, hey, Rook's got game, uh, is a really good indication that Cameron Dantzler's on the right track early on. And what's interesting is is he's he's starting to get looks not I mean Jeff Gladney's had a pretty good camp too, but he's starting to get looks over Gladney. in terms of when they're going up against 11 personnel looks, they're putting Dantzler outside and then um, Gladney's kind of rotating in the slot. And so I, I, I'm I, curious to see who is getting more snaps week one. It kind of might depend on the personnel groupings they're going against, but they seem to really like Dantzler as a boundary corner. And then Gladney may or may not play outside. He may or may not play in the slot, but... It, it's starting to look like they're, they're kind of locking in Dantzler to play that boundary role. And kind of like we talked um, with Arnett under Gunther, like, again, it's the same kind of thing with Zimmer. Like, even though Dantzler, I think, is a little bit stiff, he's going to be protected on those quick inside breaks that somebody of his frame will typically be susceptible to because he's going to have Eric Kendricks right there. He's going to have Harry right there. Like he's, he's always going to have inside help in that system. So he can just use the boundary and use his length. Um, you know, that, that PBU that we saw against Thielen where he's just, you know, throwing him into the boundary and using his length, throwing that hand up. Like that's going to be what he does like every single snap. So it, it, it certainly fits his skill set. Um, but I am curious to see if he starts out snapping Jeff Gladney solely because they kind of needed a boundary corner more than they needed a nickel corner. Yeah, I think the thing you described about Dantzler is he reminds me a little bit of, quote-unquote, the Seahawks corner, right? Yes, Seahawks have 100%. a very particular profile of guys that are long. They will not take corners who have short arms or, or are of short stature, especially not if they're going to play them outside. Uh, and they ask them to do very specific things. Zimmer's system is not the same. Um, as the one that Pete Carroll's teams run, but uh, his requirements are not all that different. He wants guys on the outside that have length, and you said it before we started the podcast, that length is going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. And um, as a Bears fan, I fear that a little bit uh, because Dantzler is one of those guys that can get it done using the tools that he has. Is his technique on the outside as pretty as Arnett's? It's not. Is it as effective 
it Apparently. Is. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I mean, if you look at his college tape, it is. It's two guys doing the same thing in two different ways, but ending up with the same result. So uh, three guys that were pretty high on that maybe other folks weren't necessarily as high on. They're, they're certainly highly drafted corners. Don't get us wrong. Um, Motley is a guy, is the exception, is a guy that we stumped for early, ended up going undrafted. Bucks get a great value, but Arnett looks like, well, all three of them look like they're really starting off uh, on the right foot. Uh, and that is fantastic for them and, and great for the teams that drafted them. Now, we're going to close out the show on a little bit of a depressing note, and that's that uh, all the 49ers are dead. Uh, they, they've taken <laughs> they've taken a lot of injuries. Uh, I am uh, reminded of the Mark Twain quote that <laughs> reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> I think they're, I mean, it's it's looking like, a, you know, a freaking Final Destination sequel out there. You lose Jalen Hurd. To an ACL, Brandon Ayuk's pulling up with a hammy, which, I mean, hamstrings in mid-August can can linger into the season and cause problems for an entire year. We saw that last year um, with Nasir Adderley, who got a hamstring around this time. We talked about him earlier, and the hamstring bothered him literally the whole year. You know, Will Fuller tweaked a hammy in August, and it bothered him the whole year. He was on the injury report every single game except two, I think. So, you know, hammies this time of year, they don't, they don't really go away. So I, I ukes that that thing's going to be a problem for him. And then Debo Samuel, who had a, a pretty severe foot injury earlier this offseason, there are doubts that he's going to be ready for the first few weeks. So he might not play until October as well. So you got three receivers who were expected to contribute a lot this season, no longer on the field, um, potentially none of them being on the field for, for week one, especially uh, Debo and Hurd, obviously. And so now you're, you're, if I'm Kyle Shanahan, I'm kind of looking around. I'm like, okay, how am I going to fill in all these targets? How am I going to fill in all these yardage? What, what can I do? You know, who's, who's going to be my guys to get the opportunity? And I, I think there's three names that really pop out, and that's Dante Pettis, it's Kendrick Bourne, and it's Trent Taylor, who have all been on the team for a few years now, even going back to that uh, when Jimmy first got traded over there. They won five in a row in the end of, I think it was 2017. Um, you know, when they went on that run, you know, Kendrick Bourne and, and Trent Taylor and Dante Pettis were a big part of them beating a then-dominant Jacksonville defense. And I think it's going to kind of come full circle, and they're going to lean on those same guys to get them through the first part of this season until Ayuk comes back and until Debo comes back. Uh, and, and I think it's fascinating to me that this that even after going to the Super Bowl, like week one of this season might be one of Kyle Shanahan's greatest tests as an offensive coordinator trying to make this passing offense work with a bunch of receivers that, uh, you know, going into this camp were supposed to be second and third stringers. Yeah, it's a fascinating look. Uh at his ability to scheme and adjust, which is the mark of all great NFL coaches, right? Is the ability to adjust because things are going to happen that you didn't expect, whether it's injuries, whether it's trends in the league, whether it's enforcement of rules, any number of things, all great coaches are going to adjust not only over the course of a season, but even over the course of a game. We talk about halftime adjustments and who makes the best halftime adjustments is who's going to win the game. So it'll be fascinating to see what Shanahan does trying to cobble this together. Dante Pettis is going to look great in training camp because Dante Pettis is a space player. He is very fast and he has a knack for creating separation. Um, And that is the kind of thing that shows up very well in seven on seven drills, right? Mm -hmm. Pettis's uh, opportunity is to play better through contact when he gets bodied that's the book on dante pettis if you want to take him out of the game get on him at the line be physical with him and over the course of the game as a smaller receiver he is not he's going to lose effectiveness so until he shows an ability to counter that piece that's going to be what defensive coordinators throw at him because that's what works right now quite frankly so he still looks great in camp. He's creating a ton of separation. He's still got a ton of speed. Uh, how's Mike Shanahan going to get him free releases so he can use that speed and hurt people? Um, 
Trent Taylor is, I don't want to say the opposite, uh, but he's not as fast. He's a classic slot receiver, and he works against contact very, very well. He's also really, really quick. I wouldn't call him necessarily a deep threat. Uh, again, some creative scheming could could get him some deeper looks, but Trent Taylor is one of those guys that is not afraid to catch it over the middle, um, is more of a classic slot threat, think as sort of Edelman mold. Um but he should get a ton of early looks because he's the he's the stability here, right? Of of all the names we've talked about, he's the guy that's gotten the most snaps and been the most uh, regular contributor in the offense, anyways. And now he's just going to get more of that. So, all you fantasy players out there, you want some fantasy fun? Um, buy Trent Taylor low right now. Let him rack up stats over the first month while Debo and uh, Brandon Ayuk try and come back from their injuries. And then right before they do, trade him mm-hmm. get <laughs> and get something for him, for him because he's going to have some great looking stats over the first month. You're going to be able to tempt somebody in your league to bite on him. Uh, and then his, you know, he's still going to be a contributor over the course of the year. But certainly when when Debo comes back, Shanahan has shown a, a proclivity to get him the ball in a myriad of different ways and that's definitely going to reduce taylor's touches you know what i half expect kyle to do is not even try to focus on the next man up uh aspect of this you know not even trying to focus on born not even trying to focus on pettis but really leaning into the strength of the team which is 22 personnel you know, let's let's roll Kittle out there. Let's roll Charlie Warner out there. Let's roll Usechek. You know, our myriad of running backs with Mostert and Coleman and McKinnon and Jamichael Hasty, who's looking. You know, you uh, mean the three horsemen of the apocalypse? You know, I I I <laughs> I think if I was Kyle, I would almost lean into that and and just say, look, we're going heavy. We're we're doing heavy metal all day long. We're going to mash the run game. You know, we have all these versatile guys. Like, we can still get into four verts out of 22 personnel. Like, they, they can still do it because of, of who their running backs are, because of who their fullback is, because of who their tight ends are. Like, they can still stretch you deep. So even though they're going to be rolling out in heavy personnel, like, I, it's not really going to affect their passing game that much. I would almost expect them to fully commit to that and then probably just have – one receiver, whether it's Pettis or Bourne, on the field. And then if they absolutely have to go to 11, yeah, they can do it. But I think they're going to do everything in their power to avoid that situation because I truly think they're best players. Like, if you want to put your best 11 on the field, which Shanahan is a big proponent of, that's 22 personnel. Yeah, and you know whose model he could follow for that, for that early season heavy metal mash the opponents, especially if they try and go small or light? Baltimore? Belichick oh yeah right. yeah Belichick is the guy that did that that said you know he led he was as usual ahead of most of the charge at least in terms of effectiveness there were other teams that had tried to do it um, Jacksonville notably notably had tried to load up and go heavy heavy to overwhelm smaller defenses but they weren't near as effective as Belichick when he said okay we're gonna we're gonna counter the sort of lighter faster trend and we're gonna load up and he went on that run where he just came out and hammered people relentlessly very old school obviously new school creativity to it and Shanahan is I would say one of the top three run designers in the NFL right now oh easily I would even say he's the best yeah, I, you know, there's an argument for the top spot, absolutely, and I, I, I wouldn't say you're wrong if you went to the mat for that. Yeah, so it's, it's San Francisco. You've got it's a Baltimore. great run. Yeah, you've got a great run designer, as you said. You've got personnel that has been built to maximize not only the effectiveness when they do decide, all right, that's it, we're going to run it, but also if you want to, you sort of morph out of that. You've got personnel that's versatile enough. Uh, to make that happen specifically use check and kittle so i wouldn't i think that's a great way to look at san francisco's first month is shanahan just showcasing the heavy power run game and as many pieces of sort of versatile disguise as he can get to to use those piece those two particular pieces in the offense I'm telling you guys charlie warner it's going to be oh, a thing. I can't wait for Mr. Warner's opportunities. Warner was my guy. It's going to be so, a thing. 
Yeah, that's I'm gonna nickname them the Three Horsemen of the Apocalypse, <laughs> right? Kittle, use check and Werner, man. When you see those guys on the field as a defense, you just know it's gonna be a long day. They are they are coming. They are gonna block their butts off. So, um, tons of fun. How was your? I I don't eat. How many ingredients did that thing have? Hatch green chili bacon black walnut they're, old they're fashioned. berries and <laughs> walnuts and it sounded like muesli by the time you were done with it i was like that sounds tremendous for breakfast with yogurt but wait no it's a drink you know I, how, I, how I was still it have, I, well a it was excellent but since okay. you brought up breakfast i still have a little bit of this bacon <laughs> bourbon left maybe i can throw that into some pancake batter and we, yes. could, and we could just have a wonderful sunday morning this weekend dude we we do that at our house we we do um uh, banana bourbon pancakes, which are fantastic. Oh, so if geez. you have bananas that are a little bit past the point, anybody familiar with bananas foster as a dessert, um, it's a little bit like that. Uh, but yeah, you just mash up your sort of banana that you don't want to eat straight up anymore, throw it in your whatever your favorite pancake batter is, and then throw just a little bit of your favorite bourbon in there to counter it, the sweetness with a little bit of sort of smokiness. Oh, it's tremendous. It's so good. It is 9.15 at night, and I want breakfast now. Thanks. <laughs> breakfast th- for dinner th- is the you best, for that. man. Oh, yeah, my no. God. Uh, my gift to you. Anyways, the Everybody's Brewing uh, Petrichor Hellas Lager. Uh, I like it a lot. It's definitely, for only having 20 IBUs, has a little bit more bite to it on the back end uh, than I thought. But it is, uh, as billed, easy drinking. Has that, they say that, uh, you know, a subtle sweetness reminiscent of warm baked bread, maybe on the front, not necessarily in the back. Those German malts really come through and sort of finish it off with those noble hops to give you that little bit of tang that you expect from a lighter lager. Um, so maybe not quite as as smooth or uh, anti-bitter as, as some folks most like might like, but um, really like the style. Uh, everybody's brewing does a great job of putting their beers together to have a, a very sort of full body and profile. So, um, if you're into the style, absolutely give it a try. Um, liked it a lot, almost done with it. Good, good drinks tonight. Good football talk tonight. Solid episode. Yeah. Go team. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. We, we rock. Um, we've got more coming for you. Uh, we are by no means done with the season cranking up. We are only going to ratchet things up. We have some, uh, we teased this last time and we're not just stringing you along. We're just actually making it better. Uh, we have some fantastic visual stuff coming for you. We have been working on some visual stuff for, for bootleg football. Uh, we've got some technological advancements that you guys have been asking for in the comments. Many of you have been saying, hey, bring video to YouTube, you know, record the two of you like you did during the draft. It's coming. We're working on it. We're just picking a system. And uh, we've got some fantastic stuff coming probably in the next week or two. We're getting very close. Yeah, if you guys um, haven't got figured this some... out, I'm very slow at everything I do. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> slow but sure. High quality. Uh, but no, we were, we couldn't be more excited about this. We've been trading emails and texts, text furiously sort of back and forth. We've been getting to look at sort of some of the prototypes and we can't wait to share this stuff with you guys and gals. Um, it has got us all amped up. We're like, we're like school kids. We got all the cool new back to school gear and we just can't wait to show it to all the classmates. So um, thank you for hanging with us. Thank you for listening uh, throughout sort of the doldrums of the off season. We are no longer there. We are staring at football here really, really quickly. So um, tons of content to come, but stay safe. Uh, thanks very much for listening and we will talk to you very soon. Later. Later.